welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast for water treaters by water treaters, where we're scaling up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hello, Scaling Up Nation. Trace Blackmore here, host of Scaling Up H2O. And folks, how cool was it last week when friend of show Colin Frayne stopped by for an interview? Well, we're going to pick up right where we left off. So if you will, please join me for part two of my interview with Colin Frayne. CWT. Colin, you and I were on a panel at the last AWT conference where you were speaking on trends in the industry, what we can expect of the water treatment of tomorrow. What are some of those trends? What are companies moving towards? What can the water treater expect from the water treatment industry? Well, I think the first thing I'm going to say is that um, I'm an old fashioned guy and I'm not sure I necessarily take to every bit of new IT technology that's out there, but the truth is the IT technology is taking over the world, so there's part of it. We know that many of the younger folks coming up wanna find a quick path to becoming a well-paid manager in some business. Um, Whether that lasts or not, I don't know. But it is difficult sometimes to find enough good service people that can join the industry. But equally, the most of the customers that we go and see are trying to find ways to automate their business and cut out facilities and utilities people. And therefore, the demands of the job gets bigger as the supply of people that could possibly handle it become, become less. So it's an intractable thing. So, so where are we going? I think that we're going the direction of more and more automation. We're coming with more and more early warning signals. Uh, we're coming with, I think, the greater use of monitors of some sort, such as biofilm monitors and not just corrosion coupons, but polarization resistance monitors. We're looking more, obviously, many, many people now are using fluorescent technology as a mechanism. Everybody seems to have the ability to have Um, results directed to their cell phone. I will tell you that I've still not managed to learn how to do that, (laughs) but but it's something. So I think that that more and more IT, independent monitoring, more short-termism is on the cards, and that means that the younger people definitely have the ability to do that, whereas us older guys think too much about it and don't do it. So I think that's, that's one important thing, that there is less and less people newer people that see this as a valuable way to get into a good job, but it is. And so maybe we've got to do more in the terms of advertising and marketing to attract people. Maybe the AWT has got to get involved with some junior people. Maybe we've got to have some sort of apprenticeships or something like that. But there will be a reduced number of people in the industry, perhaps compared with when I started half a century ago. But that means that the people that are in, in it have to be better trained, better prepared, more experienced, eyes wide open, willing to do a wider range of things. So we want good students that can be much more adaptable perhaps than, than when we had the, the, the big six water treatment companies 30, 40 years ago. It's a different world that we're in. It's a faster paced world. We've got to become more involved with monitoring and, and short termism and, and stuff like that. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted to hear from me, but that's where I I see the market going. No, that's great information. You can't have two water treaters in the room without one of them talking about somebody buying somebody else. Oh, M&As, yeah, M&As are are all, it's always been with us. Maybe we've not been quite so aware of it, but mergers and acquisitions have always been part of the business. And if you build a good business, then either you can hand it on to the family uh, or it can be part of a private equity group or it could be sold to a decent uh, uh, bigger company um, and you can see that your own heritage continues to uh, to develop. So yeah, so there's another part of the industry and that brings me I, su- I suppose onto something else in that everything that we've really been discussing so far has been about the technology of the business. But actually the business is the business is the business. You can't really grow a business if you work in it. You've got to work on a business. And so I would say that for all of the younger folks out there, it's not just learning technology, it's learning the fundamentals of business. When I started at 16, I didn't even know how to open a bank account. These days, you've got to be much, much more astute. Um, 
and you recall that a while ago I said that ultimately most employees are really cash generators and if they cannot generate cash then what's the reason for hiring them so as well as conducting your own studies on all matters technical I would also advocate that you begin to look at some of the business elements as well what does it take to run a business and how can you read a balance sheet how can you read a PL account how can you read a cash flow statement look at some annual returns from some of the big corporations look at the the big corporations in our industry that are publicly owned they all have to do annual reports I read those annual reports, I download them. You know, there might be 75, 80 pages, some of them 100 pages, and you don't need to read it all, but there's always some really interesting things about the trends or the market sectors that they're in or the way that they've decided to, from a strategic position, to develop their business uh, and go after a, a certain market sector. They're really worth looking at and if you can come for an interview and you not only have a decent technical background but you have some decent business background then the world becomes more of your oyster you've been involved in several companies either merging or acquiring another company mm -hmm. when you're working at that level what are a few of the key metrics that you always look at to see how that company's doing well, we're obviously looking at profitability and cash flow and do us, want to see what the balance sheet is like, but it's more than that. It's how does this company differentiate itself? What's its true worth? Is its true worth because of a technology that it has, because of patents, because of the people that it has, because of the market sectors that it's decided to go in? How does it differentiate itself? What will it be like in three, four, five years' time? Does, will that differentiation continue? Um, if you see that they haven't really changed the marketplace in the last 10 years, well, why would they change even if they sell the business or they merge with somebody else? So you've, you've got to look at more than just the finance. And ultimately, it's, it's really, it really does come down to the people that's involved. How motivated are they? What kinds of market sectors? Do they understand the basics of business? Do they try to go for the bigger jobs that bring more money in but are technically more challenging? But if you can solve the problem and provide the solution, the money comes in and then the whole business becomes much more valuable. So yeah, so it's, it's market differentiation. How well known are they? First thing, what's the website like? Because the, you know, generally when I get involved in some sort of uh, merger and acquisition or even just providing an overview or a review of a company, which I do periodically, the first thing I do is look at the web pages. If the web page turns you off, then there's no reason to go back to that. And that, that rightly or wrongly gives an impression of what the company's about. And so I would say if you want to be a, a really great company with great products, great services, great people, a market differentiation, make sure you also have a pretty good web page that demonstrates that because that's the first thing that you're going to go you're going to go to. The other thing is that you're going to start looking at other other things. You know, someone comes on the phone to me and they work for a company and I don't know the company, then I'm going to just go straight on the internet and check them out. I want to see if I go to LinkedIn or Facebook, not so much Facebook because I'm an old old guy, but, but you do. And more and more I see companies have their own Facebook page and they're quite interesting because they tell you the latest people to join, the latest trends that they've done, the latest big order that they bought in. And all of those begin to add to your knowledge of the company. And you cannot seriously think about potentially acquiring that business or selling that business or merging that business or using it as a base for, for growth in a particular market sector unless you feel happy and comfortable about what it is and where it's going and what you think it's worth. And so, you know, there are lots and lots of really smart guys out there and they're going to be doing the same as me. They're going to be looking at the web page, at the Facebook, at the internet. Bloomberg is another good one to go to. You look at Bloomberg and look the company up and it'll tell you who the directors are and how long they've been there and, and what they think this business is like. And you begin to put all of those together and you get a much better feel about whether this is a company that you want to be associated with or not. But the single biggest thing, half of the web pages suck.
and they, <laughs> they need some significant improvements. And, and we all like to think that we're good at doing this stuff, but there actually are experts that can put these things together for you much, much better. A thing I do like to see on on, um, on web pages of water treatment companies is some of the big projects that they've tackled and how they went to solve them. You know, so case histories, but more than the one page standard case history, actually some photographs of, of what it was like before and what it was like after and the name of the person or persons that were involved in doing it because that helps to bring value. It helps me to be, have a, a warmer feeling about the company and think, yeah, this is a good company. I should get to know this company more. I should get to know these people. I'm going to find a way to meet them at, at AWT convention, stuff like that. And I'll tell you what I do. Um, because I get involved a lot in international stuff, and I'm flying around, you know, maybe a flight to London, and then I'm going to fly to Belgium or something. I will phone people up that I don't know, but I like their company from what I've seen. I'll phone a guy up and say... Um, Sir, you know, you're the CEO of an RO company in Holland. Can I come and see you and have a cup of coffee and a chat? And everybody says yes. Nobody ever says no, you can't. And it's amazing that you get to see what other people do and they're very proud and they will show you around. And then all of a sudden, there's an opportunity to pay it back by, by giving them a lead or you get a lead and all of a sudden the network increases. This world is a really small world and everybody gets to know everybody else in this business. So if you want to be in this business, you've got to be a player. And that means developing your skills technically, financially, networking with people and all the rest of it. And there is, I think, there's actually no other better networking system than to start with the AWT. You're traveling, working with your consulting customers. Yes. I know there are a lot of people out there, including myself, about how you find these customers and what you do when you actually get there. How do you find out what their problems are? How do you know that you're tackling the right problem? And then what's your process to make sure they solve it? Okay, so let's get this, this straight. I, yes, I, I run a little consulting business and most of the time I'm, I'm on my own. But I know other consultants in the business and if there's a bigger project or a different project or I need some special skills, then I will, uh, I will engage somebody else. So for, literally, um, I had a phone call an, for an hour long uh, when I was in San Diego with a company in India um, and they want some uh, EPA um, registrations for some products apart from other things. So I instantly phoned a friend of mine who's ex-EPA employee and together we're going to have a, like a joint venture and we're going to deal with this project. When I do M&As, um, then I have another friend who really is great at helping me and two eyes always better than one. So, so that works very well. But the next thing is I actually don't go out to go and try and find customers. I don't go and knock on any doors with the idea of having enticing them to be a customer. I'm very happy to knock on their door and buy them lunch or get a cup of coffee or my last call where the Pakistan technical manager of a laboratory wanted to talk to me about cricket and how great Pakistan was and how poor England had become and feed me with a large piece of cake at the same time. So we had a really good meet and, and I had no fixed appointment. I just knocked on his door and he was really happy to see me. I go out to meet these people for my own gratification, my own enjoyment at learning what else is out there. But what happens is you begin to network with these people. All of the jobs that I get in, whether they're a little tiny job or a pretty big job, a single visit or a multi-year visit, it starts with somebody emailing me or phoning me and say, you were recommended by X, can you help me? And what I find is that in general, price is not the object. You don't really have to bid. In fact, I don't think anybody really wants to hire a cheap consultant. So the prices can become good, but more often than that, it's what's the value that you're delivering. And because you had a recommendation, you have a, a start over everybody else. And so, you know, if I can do a, a, a visit for nothing to start with, uh, then I will do that. Um, I will always give some advice. I will always recommend some uh, information. I will all, nearly always give some technical papers, and not all just by me, by, by some of the other respected people in, in the business, just to help them understand 
their problem. And what I really want to know is, what's the scale of your problem? How big is your problem? How much is it costing you? How keen are you to get this fixed? And if they become keen and they want some, uh, they, want, they want a solution to the problem, generally they say, well, where do we go from here, Colin? Well, where we go from here is, you send me some money. <laughs> and so they will wire transfer some money. And I'll kid you not, as soon as I get the money, the first thing I do is I buy a ticket and I get on a plane and go and see them to find out what the real problem is. How big is the problem? How is going to be solved? What's the politics? And there's always politics that's involved in that. And then the fact that I actually turn up on the doorstep and, and I've got a hard hat on and boots and stuff like that gives the customer the confidence that I'm going to be able to help them. Now, that doesn't mean to say that I go in with a magic wand and I already know what the real solution is going to be. I actually go in and usually for the first half an hour, I ask stupid questions. And I'm sure that sometimes the customer must look at me and think, why did he ask that? And it's because everything is site specific and I don't really understand what's going on. And so it takes me half an hour before I really understand what is going on and what the politics are and what's possible and what's not possible. And then I can start giving some direction as to where we can go from here and how long it will take and what are the steps that's involved and what the likely costs are gonna be on both sides. And then we begin to get together an agreement that can come and, and we can both sign and then we're happy and we know what's gonna be done. But just because you're a smart consultant, been in the business forever, doesn't mean to say that you know everything and certainly not turning up on site for the first time with a magic wand and you can fix everything, you can't. You've got to investigate. You have to be a good water doctor. You've got to be able to ask questions until you can eventually come up with a diagnosis that looks pretty sound. And if you can diagnose it, then the solutions become much easier. And there's always going to be more than one solution. So the more you can learn, the more you can learn from others, the more you can network, the better you're going to be and the more you're going to enjoy the job, which was where we came in half an hour ago. Colin, do you mind giving the Scaling Up Nation an example of what you're talking about? Okay, so I can give you one or two examples. So, do you remember Bob Cavano? I do remember Bob Cavano. At Scranton, a really, really great guy, and I used to really admire the technical papers that he wrote, and sometimes he stirred it up, but it was good. Um, and, and, and so here, you are, here am I, yeah, I'm telling you I'm a pretty smart uh, water treatment consultant, but I learn all the time. I don't know everything. And I read every single thing that Bob Cavano ever did. Uh, and we became quite, quite good friends. And I remember once uh, when I was still living in Florida, he phones me up and he says, I'm outside your door and I want to take you to lunch. And we had a great lunch that lasted a couple of hours. I cannot remember anything about what we ate, but it was all to do with, uh, with, with the technology. But coming back to the, to the story. So one day I get a, uh, an email and it's from uh, Argentina and uh, it's a government owned company that makes nuclear fuel, heavy water. And they wrote to me and they said, Bob Cavano says you're the guy to go to to help us. And I'm thinking, how on earth did they know about Bob Cavano? Um, and it turned out that um, this particular facility is one of only a few plants in the world that makes heavy water. And it was actually a Swiss design plant that was installed in the middle of Patagonia in, uh, in Argentina. And, uh, and it took snow melt uh, from the Andes Mountains and passed it through the world's largest deeming plant to produce ultra pure water and then used ammonia to extract, or rather the ammonium ion, to extract the deuterium and tritium uh, to make heavy water. Um, but everything was fouled up and the heat exchangers didn't work and there were, I think maybe 300 heat exchangers and the cooling tower was so large they actually gave me a bicycle to, to cycle round. And they wanted me to come out there to help them solve their problems of, of the intense fouling in the heat exchangers, the corrosion in heat exchangers, the fouled up cooling systems, the lack of ability to manufacture heavy water which was something like sixty or seventy thousand dollars a barrel, you know, a two hundred and ten liter stainless steel barrel. And so I spoke to Bob Cavano uh, up in Ohio, 
and we chatted and he said, well, they found me on the internet. And then they read some of my technical papers and thought that this is the guy to speak to. And they were using a major water treatment company, one of the big international firms. But as you know, it's all dependent on how good is the local guy. And if the local guy isn't really very good, then things don't get fixed. And that's how it was. And uh, Bob had helped them as much as he could from his office, but then said, look, at the end of the day, I'm not the guy to help you from a practical aspect in terms of solving problems on site. I can tell you all the theory of the chemistries and which chemistries to use, but you need a guy that is, you know, can get his hands dirty on site, you need to speak to Colin. So they phoned me and said, please come over. And uh, I have to tell you, it's absolutely fantastic because I flew over to Buenos Aires, I got picked up, and before I got on my uh, domestic uh, plane, we had several hours. Um, so I went round, uh, they showed me tango dancing in Buenos Aires. I had this superb lunch. I toured the Japanese gardens in Buenos Aires and the Pink Palace and stuff like that. And then I got on a plane and went to, uh, to Nukem in Argentina and looked at this plant. And we spent several days going through all of the things that needed to be done and putting together a plan. Now, I'll tell you that the plan took two years to fix. This wasn't something you could fix over, overnight. So, you know, all of the, the 300 heat exchangers were non-teamer manufactured. So they didn't meet American specifications for heat exchangers and they all began to fail. Flow rates were less than one foot a second in them and so they were fouling. Uh, the chemistry that they had didn't work. The cooling system used to have maybe 150 ppm of ammonia present in it um, and a lot of that spilt out and went into the river so we had to find ways to deal with that so we had to modify the wastewater treatment plant. We had to clean out the cooling system and they really didn't believe me when I told them that we were going to put half a tonne of dispersant, biodispersant in there. You know, it, and, and we had then had to find a way to stop six feet of foam in a cooling tower that was hundreds of yards long. But finally, they believed what I said and we did it and we extracted more than 20 tons, 20,000 kilos of bio slime from the cooling tower. So, so this is a backhoe that we've got inside a cooling tower to be able to deal with that. And then the 300 heat exchangers, we had to repair them or get new ones and we can't bring them all online at the same time. It took two years. So I actually went to a really superb company that makes vapor phase corrosion inhibitors. You know those guys up in uh, uh, White Bear Parkway, Minnesota. And, and, and we bought a, um, not a pallet, we bought a, a, a truckload of uh, VPCIs so that every time we finished a heat exchanger, we could put a VPCI in it and we could leave it for another year or 18 months until they all came together. So it was a two year project and it was a multi-visit project. Um, which culminated actually in my wife also coming to Buenos Aires and going tango dancing there because she was fine. So it was a great occasion of mixing business with some pleasure. So that was a two year project, but the government was under the gun because it had to deliver under contracts to Canada and India and it couldn't be until someone came and gave some direction as to how to solve the problem, how to create new formulations that would deal with that. And there was a whole bunch of things, but it was a, it was a, a really good exercise. So Colin, it's funny you mentioned Bob Cavano. When I started Blackmore Enterprises 2004, my first convention with AWT was in Palm Springs. And I was just getting involved with AWT. I didn't know a lot about the association. So I went over there by myself and I believe I had to make a connecting flight over in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So we got on a big plane here in Atlanta, went to Phoenix, then got on a little teeny plane in Phoenix to go over to Palm Springs. Well, I sat next to a gentleman, had no idea who he was. And he asked me, where, where are you going to? And I told him I was going to the Association of Water Technologies Convention. And he said, me too, that was Bob Cavano. We had a 45 minute plane ride 
It was the most fascinating conversation mm -hmm. I ever had. I always cannot wait to get off of an airplane. I was hoping that that plane was five hours longer than it actually was. And that was one of the reasons that I started this show. Had I recorded that conversation, I think so many people could have gotten benefit out of mm -hmm. it. So, uh, and unfortunately now, I, I can't interview Bob Cavano. So I wanted to make sure that uh, more people in the water treatment community could have access to all these water treatment Jedi that we have out there because things that you know, things, I think we mentioned Bruce Ketrick already, all these guys, you have, have made mistakes that I can learn from, that other people can learn from, and everybody's fine with sharing them. Yeah. So indirectly, Bob Cavano was responsible for yeah. this podcast. With this consulting work, you don't always win, you know. So, as an example, I'd worked in I'd worked I've worked in most of the Caribbean islands, and in fact, at one stage, I actually had some some factories and and uh, warehouses and so on uh, in the Caribbean. So the Bahamas and Guyana and uh, Suriname and um, Guatemala and Honduras and Belize in Trinidad, uh, Barbados, um, all of those places I've, I've worked in. So I remember I get this call uh, from people I've worked with before in Trinidad. And um, so I go over to Trinidad, and it's actually longer than you think because it's right at the, the bottom end of, uh, of the Caribbean. So I go to Trinidad, and, uh, and I'm working on a number of different things. And a lot of it is business related, how to grow their company, how to improve their marketing and distribution of, of products and services uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the, the western and southern part of the Caribbean. And then we, we're doing some lectures and programs like that, looking at chemistry and formulations and a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of things. And, and this is done on a fixed price, you know. This is how much I would charge you per day. You pay that amount of, of dollars each day and pay for the airplane and then you pay for the, uh, the hotel. And so that's what they do. Now, when I'm there, my time is your time. Anything you want, anything, any, it doesn't have to be in a spec, anything you want is what we'll discuss. And so we did all of this and then when it was all finished, they said, oh, you've still got some time before your plane goes, Colin. Could you kind of do some consulting for us? Sure, okay, right, well, we're gonna go over to the island where there's an oil refinery, and we're gonna look at a company, a private company, that has agreed to take their oily wastewater and to clean it all up and then resell it to them as makeup for boiler plant, for high pressure steam boiler plant. And uh, so we would like you to kind of be us and, uh, and go and consult and show them what they're doing wrong. So we go over to see this facility, and that's what they've got. They have water coming in, which is oily wastewater, and then they have a series of processes designed to clean up that water such that when it emerges from a reverse osmosis plant, it can be sold back to them as high quality feed. So I went on a quick tour, and probably after 20 minutes, I could see all the individual components that they had got which was like a coalescer to, uh, to remove the oil, and then they had a biological treatment plant, and then they had a uh, tower to actually cool the water down so mesophilic can work on activated sludge and, and destroy that. Um, and then they had a, uh, some cartridge filters and then a reverse osmosis plant, and none of it worked. It was absolutely all full of oil. And the engineer in charge knew everything and really didn't want to listen to me because he'd already decided what the problems were. But you look at it and you think, this is absolute utter devastation. And it was quite clear that from a business perspective, they were likely to be sued because they weren't able to supply the right quality of water. So I went round and, and said, OK, so let's have a look. You have an oily waste water separator that isn't working. You have all of your reservoirs fouled with oil. You have a biological fixed film bioreactor. It's full of oil. You have a cooling tower that you can't use anymore. It's full of oil. You have a reverse osmosis plant. You have a sand filter that doesn't work. And in fact, actually that was a laugh because it was a Chinese, a massive Chinese sand filter 
but the grains of sand were rocks. They weren't sand, it was <laughs> rocks. It was never gonna filter anything at all. And then they had the reverse osmosis membranes and I'm looking at the totally fouled membranes that's absolutely screwed. And so I, I said, okay, well, would you like me to tell you what I think we should do? And it was, no, we know what to do. And what we're now gonna do is spend $2 million and put another piece of equipment before the reverse osmosis, and this is going to be a variable film microfilter. And this kind of equipment looks like a, a regular ultrafiltration plant, uh, vertical pressure vessels, but inside it's a bit like a, um, a bag filter. But it's, the bag is made of a membrane, and what happens is, the higher the pressure that you push the water through, this stretches and actually the pores become smaller and smaller. And you can get it from 10 micron going down to perhaps a, a one micron filtration rate, depending upon how you stretch it and how you pressurize it. And I thought to myself, why are you wasting $2 million on a piece of equipment that is also gonna get fouled, where for one-tenth of that price, you can go back to the very beginning and you can improve your oil removal, which was the, the source of the problem. The real problem was they had signed a contract to take so many gallons a day and produce so many gallons a day, or cubic meters really, without specifying what the minimum and maximum water quality was that they were gonna be able to accept. And so they signed this in total blindness, expecting the water quality to be the same all the time. And of course it changed. Why did it change? Because of the variations in production and the variations in crudes that they were being received in the first place. And so any attempt for me to provide some useful consulting and show them what the real pro problem was going to be and how to solve it was not listened to at all, so I don't always win as a consultant. Now, I still get paid because my client pays me X amount, but, but you cannot convince everybody that what they should do is in their own best interest. So the consulting work has its downside. Now, I can go away and laugh and think these stupid idiots, all they're ever gonna do is waste more and more money, but. It was just such, for me, it was a shame that I did not like to see all this very nice and very expensive equipment get totally fouled because someone signed a contract that was stupid, someone didn't put sufficient oil separation equipment in and then were too proud to take any, advi any advice. So not all my consulting projects ends up as a total, uh, total winners. Um, you win some and you lose some. For the most part, it's good, but it, was, it sticks in my mind because it was so clear what the root cause analysis was when you do your troubleshooting, but somebody in charge did not want to listen, and it was going to end in a big lawsuit. What's the funniest thing you've seen in water treatment? The funniest thing? All right. Well, I've seen lots of funny things. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. So I told you that I started work at 16. Now, in those days... Phosphonates had not been invented for cooling water. They actually had been invented and they were used as they still are today, actually, as a supplement for bones to help strengthen bones. But phosphonates had not been invented for water treatment. I think all we had was polyacrylate and polyacrylamide. Even polymalic acid hadn't really been invented. So, uh, and I remember some old uh, boiler plants where literally I would be using pig's bladder you know, and, uh, and potato starches and tannins as a boiler treatment in dark satanic mills. But, uh, but in terms of funniness, so I'm working in this power plant and we have a number of big cooling systems around this plant and we were using sulfuric acid and we were using uh, polyacrylate um, and a bit of antifoam as our, uh, as our control. And, um, oh, and we were also using amines as well. You know, the whole, you know, we're all into these polyamines now. Well, we were using polyamines in those days. So this is like 1964, we were using polyamines. And we had to produce our own. And we used a, a mix of polyamines that became a paste. And this paste we put into floating baskets in the cooling towers, and it would very, very slowly solubilize one or two part per million at most, and would eventually film 
our cooling towers and give us some protection. Of course, we didn't have uh, galvanized uh, hot dip cooling towers in those days. They were primarily wood, but, but that worked. Anyway, so there is a strike and 60,000 people are out on strike. They want better wages, but we're in utilities and facilities and we have to keep working. So it suddenly became my job to go and check all the cooling towers and um, make sure that the sulfuric acid pumps were working and the amine feeders were working. And we got a bit of polyacrylate going into the, into the cooling towers. So I had a brand new lab coat, a white lab coat. And we had like recently invented nylon shirts and nylon socks and nylon underwear and nylon lab coats. So I had to go out and inspect these. And the very first cooling system that I came to was a pretty large cooling system. And, uh, and, and I could see that the sulfuric acid pump wasn't working very well. And so, okay, so I was uh, 17 years of age and a really experienced engineer. So I thought I knew nothing. I started fiddling with it. And all of a sudden the pump starts working, the sulfuric acid, 98% sulfuric acid, pump starts working, but the hose line breaks and sulfuric acid came out and spurted all over me, literally all over me. And I had a white lab coat that was made of nylon. Within about three seconds, it had disappeared and all I had was black lapels and, and the double stitching where the buttons were. And I had white nylon socks and all I had was a carbon ring around my ankles. And the only way then to stop the sulfuric acid from burning me was physically to jump into the cooling system. So I came out of the cooling system with the sulfuric acid washed off me, but like 30% of my pants gone, all my uh, ankle socks gone and my lab coat uh, gone. I looked at an absolutely horrific sight. Colin, we have over 10,000 people listening to this show in over 60 countries. What's the one thing you want the Scaling Up Nation to get out of this interview? One thing, never stop learning, never stop trying to improve yourself, never stop trying to find challenges because it's solving challenges that becomes the most rewarding thing in this business. Great advice. Colin, I'm almost done with you, but now we have a few lightning round questions. So are you ready for that? Let's hope I know the answers. Come on, what, what's up? All right, so now you have the ability to go back in time and visit yourself on your first day as a water treater. What advice would you give yourself? Oh, first advice? Gosh, I remember those days when I was 16 and knew absolutely nothing, but had to learn very quickly. What advice would I have given myself? Probably dress smarter. Well, I had no money. I'm not sure I really, I can give you any advice except to say that I was 16, I was put straight into the job. There was really no mentoring at that stage. You had to learn it yourself and there was no internet, nothing like that. It was ask other people to, for help. And, and I was, it was very good because there were people there that had been in the business two, three, four years, knew a lot more than me. They would show me how to short circuit thing, uh, short circuit things to get jobs done. And so I would, say, I would say, yes, a valuable thing is asking people for help because people are always very prepared to help you and, and learn that, which is, which is what your exchange forum is. I'll give you an example. I was in that power plant for, for a couple of years and then from there I moved and I went to a foundry and I had to work 12 hours a day because that was the shift. Uh, and my job was every time there was gonna be a nodular or gray iron uh, pouring, then I had to take a small ingot and then I had to cool it down, section it with a big grinder, polish it, and then I had to put it uh, onto a, a spectrophotometer and do a... Um, it was a silver electrode that we were using and find the spectra and from that spectra I could get a metallurgical analysis. And all of this had to be done within about a minute and a half because the foundry floor above us wanted to pour this molten cast iron. Uh, now, the spectrophotometer was the size, I think the room and everything else was like about half the size of a tennis court. So it wasn't anything you could put on a laboratory bench. And then 
another part of the job once we were doing that was actually to work on the bench and we would do wet analyses. And I used to see these guys that have been doing the job for years, technicians, and they could do 50 manganese or 25 sulfurs or uh, 15 carbon tube analyses or um, a dozen of this or a dozen, and they could sit down and they could have lunch and they could have coffee, and I never, ever could catch up. I could never sit down, I could never get a coffee, I could never get a sandwich until I asked for help. And then they would show me a smarter, quicker, better way to do the analysis and get more accuracy and more reproducibility such that eventually I could sit down on a lab stool and have a coffee and a sandwich. So that, that came down to asking people. And they weren't necessarily um, more educated than me. Very often they were technicians, but they'd been doing the job for 20 years and they knew their job inside out. They were older people, but you had to respect those people and they would really help you so that you could do the job better. In this industry, that's what we've got to do. We've got to rely on mentors of some sort. I think we hadn't even invented the word mentors at that time, <laughs> right? But that's what they were. They were mentors that would help me do my job better and that's what we've got to do. Um, so yeah, first day, Find a mentor to help you grow and, and do your job better. When they make a movie about your life, what actor do they get to play Colin Frame? Uh, who's the biggest comedian? Because, because my, my youngest daughter in New York says to me, Dad, she said, how can it be that a guy as smart as you can be so stupid all the time with the things that you do? And, and so, yeah, they would need to find a good comedian because, yeah, you think this is like the, the sophisticated Colin. No, I'm not. I screw up so many times. My, my, my kids and, and my wife and grandchildren, we all get together every single year. We have a vacation together on one of the Caribbean islands, the Bahamas or St. Thomas or St. John or, St. or something like that. And they absolutely love being together in the kitchen with a large glass of wine and peeling the vegetables and saying, do you remember the time when Dad ran out of gas on the top of the mountain? Do you remember the time when he got... In, uh, embedded in a dried up riverbed, two feet deep with sand. And this goes on and on and on. And it's the number of stupid things that I've done in my life. But it makes for great entertainment. So, so the answer is if they do ever did a film, they'd have to find a good comedian. All right. So now you can talk to anybody throughout history. Who would it be with and why? <sighs> I think there's lots and lots of people that I'd like to speak to. I, what I do find fascinating, and it, and it might well start with somebody like Michelangelo, that was not only a superb painter, artist, but mechanically engineering was great. But what I also, from my chemistry background, what I really like is the mid-1980s, uh, mid-1850s, 1860, 1870, when when... We, all of these people were inventing rules, finding new elements, discovering reactions and stuff like that. And there's a whole bunch of people, probably from Charles Darwin onwards, and, and you look at, you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Well, who was Heisenberg? I'd love to be in a lab with Heisenberg and all the people that, that were there with him. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would really, really love to talk to the scientists of their age, from Michelangelo onto Darwin, onto the scientists from the 1850s, 1860s, all the way up to the modern day. And there's not one single person, but I find a real fascination in the discovery of, of the discovery of elements, the discovery of the reactions, the way that the reactions can get changed into viable production processes and the money that then can then flow from, from there. Interesting thing, Cavendish Laboratory. I've been to the Cavendish Laboratory in uh, Cambridge, at Cambridge University. It's a nondescript red brick building that is full of laboratories and research has been done. And it was built at about 1830 or 1840, something like that, in, in Cambridge City, in part of Cambridge University. That laboratory generated 27 Nobel Prize winners. Wow. I would have loved to have been, I never went to Oxford University or Cambridge University. <laughs> I would have loved to have had spent some time in Cavendish Laboratory and be able to see what went on and see the, 
the, the mementos from the people that were there before and the things that they had invented. That would be, or discovered, that would be fantastic. Well, Colin, I want to thank you for coming on Scaling Up h Toe. This has been so much fun to interview you. I'm sure we could probably spend another two hours talking, but I'm going to have to ask you to come back some other time, and I just want to thank you for coming on the show. Well, if we, we could certainly spend another two hours, and I think I'd probably divert it and give you some of the total stupid stuff I've done in my life around the world. The fact that I've escaped with only, like, the loss of two fingers you know, is, is pretty good because it's a wonder I haven't lost my, my neck as well. But no, I've had a really great time. As I told you, I don't have any difficulty in talking and, and I love talking and everybody in this business does. But it's a fascinating industry. It's a never ending industry. And I'm really, really pleased to have had the opportunity of, to sit down and talk with you. Thank you very much indeed. Nation, I know you enjoyed that interview. Colin, thank you so much for sharing some of the stories that you've been able to amass over your water treatment career. And folks, there is no secret about it. Colin had never listened to the show before today. After we finished recording, I showed Colin how to get podcast on his smartphone, and he let me know that when he went back home, he listened to a couple of episodes. So Colin's listened to the show now. And of course, Colin's been on the show several times when I've done my walking around either technical training or the convention at AWT or even the recent ASHRAE show. And I got Colin to do a quick interview. Well, we finally got him on the show. You all in the Scaling Up Nation can see why I wanted to bring him on the podcast. I hope you enjoyed that. Some of the themes that Colin spoke about are themes of this show, and I think it's great because he has never listened to this show before we did that recording. But he said, don't do water treatment alone. There's so many people out there that are so willing to help you. All you have to do is ask. And you know that one of my common themes for Scaling Up H2O is for people to ask others to mentor them. Well, you heard it from somebody who's been in the water treatment industry for well over 50 years that he still gets information from others who know different things than he does. So folks, you never stop learning. That was another theme that he kept on saying. That's a theme of this show. So there's no reason for you to try to blaze that trail by yourself. Find people you want to associate with. Find people that have information that you know you need to know, and then ask if you can learn from them. Associate yourself with people who have knowledge that you want. And then, you, of course, you reciprocate, and I can't tell you how many relationships that I have seen grow, that I have personally experienced based on that mentor-mentee relationship. Colin said, always be learning. And as you've heard me say on this show, my father always told me the day that I stopped learning in water treatment was the day I needed to find another job. Colin, being in the industry for so many years, says that he does not have a day that goes by that he does not learn. So folks, put yourself out there in the position that you're always learning new things. Are you going to venues that allow you to learn new things? Are you asking questions of people that allow you to learn new things? Are you reading? Are you doing research that allow you to learn new things? things. New things, you're going to have to take some work at. You're going to have to make the decision that I am consciously going to go out and I'm going to learn something new every day and then reward yourself when that happens. Folks, look for that each and every day. Well, you might have heard me mention this to Colin. We're over 10,000 subscribers in over 60 countries. Folks, that is amazing to me. And I want to thank all of you out there in the Scaling Up Nation. And I want to ask that you help me not stop there. I know there are a lot of water treaters out there that don't know about Scaling Up H2O. So all of you out there are ambassadors of the show. And I ask you to talk to other water treaters 
leaders about scaling up H2O because hopefully this show is the catalyst that gets us thinking just a little bit different and it allows the water treatment industry to continually get better because all of us are getting better. Folks, thanks so much for listening and I look forward to coming to you next week on Scaling Up H2O.